The prevalence of ticks and their associated diseases are major constraints to livestock farming in most parts of sub-Saharan Africa. It is estimated that on a worldwide scale, the economic losses due to ticks and tick-borne diseases, including the costs incurred to control them, amount to several billion US dollars annually. The prevalence of ticks, which transmit the important tick-borne diseases, tyleriosis, babesiosis, anaplasmosis, and heartwater to cattle, is probably the most important factor restricting the introduction of more productive livestock and the improvement of existing livestock in developing countries in Africa. Apart from the diseases which they transmit, ticks also injure their hosts by the direct damage they cause to the skin, thus permitting entry of other parasites such as bacteria, which may cause abscesses or the maggots of some flies. Different diseases may be transmitted by the same or different tick species. Therefore, knowing the ecology of the vector ticks is important in understanding the epidemiology of tick-borne diseases. Although the distribution of the specific tick or ticks that transmit a particular parasite usually defines the distribution of that particular tick-borne disease, this may vary greatly over time. For example, climatic changes, such as successive years of above average rainfall, may render certain areas temporarily well suited to a specific tick, thus allowing it to gradually extend its range into areas where it and the diseases it transmits previously did not occur. In this video production, the most important tick-borne diseases of cattle in Africa south of the Sahara, in particular tyleriosis, babesiosis, anaplasmosis, and heartwater will be briefly discussed. Tyleriosis is a general term used for infections in cattle with one or more of a number of tyleria species. Some of these may cause only mild or subclinical disease in cattle so-called benign tyleriosis. But by far the most important and pathogenic in Africa south of the Sahara is Tyleria parva. Although not the most widespread of the tick-borne diseases, Tyleria parva infection is considered by many to be the most important tick-borne disease of cattle in eastern, central and southern Africa and is transmitted mainly by the brown ear ticks. Ripicephalus appendiculatus and Ripicephalus zambesiensis. Based on certain observed differences in different countries, three forms of the disease are usually recognized. East Coast fever, Zimbabwe tyleriosis or January disease, and corridor disease or buffalo disease. The most important difference being that corridor disease is almost exclusively transmitted from buffalo to cattle, so-called buffalo-associated Tyleria parva, whereas the other two persist in cattle populations in the absence of buffalo, so-called cattle-associated Tyleria parva. For most practical reasons, however, these diseases should be considered to be of equal importance. The incubation period for Tyleria parva infections is usually about two weeks. Typically, the disease is characterized by a high fever, enlargement of the superficial lymph nodes, severe lung edema, often manifesting as difficulty to breathe, and wasting, usually ending fatally. A small number of animals may recover, but recovery is prolonged and the animals may remain in poor condition and unproductive for months. The most prominent feature seen in a carcass of an animal that died of East Coast fever or corridor disease is often the severe accumulation of fluid in the lungs, frequently also accompanied by large amounts of froth in the trachea and bronchi. The lymph nodes are usually enlarged and sometimes severely congested. 
The spleen may also be enlarged, and the kidneys often have whitish nodules of varying sizes on their surface. Ulcers or superficial erosions may be found in the abomasum or in the intestinal mucosa. Although not always very obvious, anemia may also be present. Heart water, or caudriosis, is a tick-borne disease of cattle, sheep, goats, and some wild ruminants, which is caused by Ehrlichia ruminantium, previously known as caudria ruminantium. Heart water is transmitted by ticks of the genus Amblyoma, the bont ticks, and the major vectors are Amblyoma variegatum, the tropical bont tick, which has the widest distribution in Africa and has also inadvertently been exported to some Caribbean islands, and Amblyoma hebraeum, the South African bont tick, which is the main vector of heart water in southern Africa. The incubation period of heart water in cattle is generally around two weeks. Acute heart water, the most common form of the disease, mainly affects cattle between the ages of 3 and 18 months. It is characterized by a fever of 40 degrees Celsius or higher, which may persist for 3 to 6 days. A severe, often bloody, diarrhea may be the most prominent symptom in some cases. Ultimately, nervous signs occur which range from mild incoordination to pronounced convulsions. The animals are hypersensitive when handled or exposed to sudden noise or bright light. Slight tapping with a finger on the forehead of the animal often evokes an exaggerated blinking reflex. They frequently show a peculiar high-stepping gait that is usually more pronounced in the front limbs. Later on, they often fall down, lie on their sides, show a rearward extension of the neck and either have frequent bouts of leg peddling movements or the legs may be extended and stiff. Young calves have an age-related resistance which usually lasts for only the first four weeks of life, although it may persist for several months in some animals. This age resistance is not absolute as infection of some calves less than three weeks of age may occasionally also result in fatal disease. A severe accumulation of light yellow transparent fluid that may coagulate on exposure to air in the pericardium and the thorax, and in some cases a small amount of fluid in the abdominal cavity, are striking changes in most fatal cases of the disease. Bovine babesiosis, or red water, is a tick-borne disease caused by Babesia species that occur in the red blood cells of cattle. Two species are economically important in Africa. Babesia bigemina that causes African red water and Babesia bovis that causes Asiatic red water. Asiatic red water is restricted to areas where the Asiatic blue tick, Repicephalus buophilus microplus, is prevalent usually the higher rainfall areas in the eastern parts of southern Africa. Babesia bigemina is principally transmitted by the common indigenous African blue tick, Repicephalus buophilus decoloratus, as well as by the Asiatic blue tick, and thus enjoys a much wider distribution. Calves up to the age of about nine months are protected from developing serious disease by a largely non-specific age-related immunity. Thereafter, susceptibility to severe disease gradually increases with age. The incubation period following tick transmission is usually about two weeks. In acute babesiosis, animals develop a fever with a body temperature of more than 40 degrees Celsius which may be present for several days before other signs become obvious. This is followed by a loss of appetite, depression, weakness and a reluctance to move. Hemoglobin pigment is often present in the urine, hence the name red water. 
This is seen earlier and more consistently in African redwater than in Asiatic redwater. Anemia, and less commonly icterus, develop and are especially obvious in more protracted cases. Diarrhea is common in Asiatic redwater, and pregnant cattle may abort. Affected animals may die from one to several days after the onset of clinical signs. Animals with Asiatic redwater are generally more severely affected than those with African redwater, and also take much longer to recover fully. Some animals with Asiatic redwater develop cerebral babesiosis, which is characterized by the development of nervous signs such as hypersensitivity, circling, head pressing, aggression, convulsions and paralysis. This may or may not accompany other signs of acute redwater. The course of the disease in these cases is usually short and the outcome is almost always fatal. Signs of cerebral or brain involvement are not seen in African redwater. Cattle that recover from babesiosis remain carriers of the infection for periods ranging from six months to several years. In animals that die of acute African redwater, lesions are similar to those found in animals that have died of severe loss of blood, that is, a pale carcass, watery blood, and a light to dark red discoloration of the urine, as seen here on the right. Icterus is often noticeable in protracted cases. Obvious signs of anemia and discoloration of the urine are often not evident in cases of Asiatic redwater, only becoming noticeable in more protracted cases, and icterus is seldom observed. In acute cases of Asiatic redwater, congestion of most organs and tissues is pronounced with pinpoint or larger hemorrhages occurring in many internal organs. The spleen is usually enlarged, sometimes to several times its normal size. Such hemorrhages in internal organs and enlargement of the spleen are not as noticeable in cases of African redwater, in which fluid accumulation in the lung is a common finding. The liver is swollen and may be yellowish-brown, with the gallbladder containing large amounts of thick granular bile. The kidneys and lymph nodes are also enlarged. In the cerebral form of the disease, the grey matter of the brain has a characteristic cherry pink colour. Anaplasmosis, or tick-borne gall sickness in cattle, is a tick and insect-borne disease caused predominantly by Anaplasma marginale. Several different tick species have been shown to be capable of transmitting anaplasmosis in Africa. Of these, the blue ticks, Repicephalus buophilus species, that also transmit babesiosis, and a number of Repicephalus or brown tick species are considered to be the most important. In addition to tick transmission, anaplasmosis can also be transmitted mechanically by some biting fly species such as stable flies and horse flies, as well as needles and instruments used in veterinary procedures which are contaminated with fresh blood. As in the case of babesiosis, a largely non-specific age-related immunity protects calves up to the age of about nine months from the serious disease. Thereafter, susceptibility to severe disease gradually increases with age. The incubation period following tick transmission is exceptionally long compared to the other tick-borne diseases and may vary from about three to eight weeks, with an average of four to six weeks. Anaplasmosis is generally characterized by fever, progressive anemia and icterus. Other signs include depression, lack of appetite, decreased milk production, rumen stasis, constipation, often indicated by the presence of dry, bile-stained feces, and weight loss. Nervous signs, such as head pressing and aggression, 
which could be confused with symptoms associated with cerebral babesiosis and heart water, may occur in some animals. Recovery following an attack of anaplasmosis is always slow, and it may take several months before an animal regains its previous condition. Relapses associated with anemic changes and fever may occur a few weeks after apparent recovery. Prominent changes in fatal cases include severe anemia, icterus, and enlargement of the spleen and liver. The pulp of the spleen is dark red and has a meaty consistency, while the cut surface of the liver varies in color from orange-brown to mottled yellow. The gallbladder is distended and contains sticky thick brown or yellowish brown bile. There is often evidence of severe gastrointestinal stasis, especially of the rumen, omasum and colon. The omasal contents are dry and impacted, and the colon contains hard, dry, often bile-stained fecal balls. The urine is yellow to dark brown due to the presence of bilirubin. The diagnosis of tick-borne diseases in cattle is usually based on the characteristic clinical signs and lesions and may be confirmed by demonstration of parasites in specific host cells during microscopic examination of smears prepared from blood and or organs that had been stained with gimsas or similar stain. In the live animal, thin blood films are prepared from capillary blood obtained from the tip of the tail or the ear. Where tyleriosis is suspected, Lymph node smears should also be prepared from fine needle aspirates of superficial lymph nodes. It is generally recommended that animals not be treated with any specific therapeutic drugs before the smears are made, because the drug could make detection of the parasites on the smears very difficult. In dead animals, Blood for the preparation of a smear can be obtained from blood vessels exposed by severing an ear close to the skull with a sharp knife. Organ impression smears are prepared from the cut surface of organs, for example, the spleen or lymph nodes. Where indicated, especially where animals show nervous signs before death, as might be expected in cerebral babesiosis or heart water, a brain smear should be prepared by crushing a small piece of brain tissue between two glass slides and carefully spreading the crushed material in short strokes. All smears should be prepared in an hygienically as possible way to prevent contamination by dirt and should be clearly marked with a waterproof marker pen or pencil to indicate the identification number of the animal. Smears must be thoroughly air-dried before staining and microscopic examination. If not immediately stained and examined, the smears should be carefully wrapped and sealed to prevent damage by soilage or breakage. Even though the smears might not be examined until some time in the future, they can be stored and will provide a valuable record. In Tyleriosis, the two life cycle stages of the parasite which might be demonstrated in cattle are the schizont and the pyroplasm stages. Schizonts are found intracellularly in lymphoblasts in lymphoid tissue throughout the body, particularly the lymph nodes and spleen, as well as in the blood, and appear as light blue bodies containing from 1 to 30 dark bluish-purple staining granules. The majority of intraerythrocytic pyroplasms are rod-shaped, but round or oval forms are also seen. Although usually single, there may be several parasites in one erythrocyte in heavy infections. Generally, the schizonts and pyroplasms of different Tyleria species cannot be differentiated morphologically but the presence of schizonts and or large numbers of pyroplasms is usually indicative of clinical disease. 
Single Babesia bovis organisms are round, oval, or irregular in shape, while paired forms are pear or club shaped, but smaller than Babesia bigemina. The angle between the paired organisms is often greater than 90 degrees, giving the organisms a bow tie appearance. In brain smears, parasitized red blood cells appear tightly packed in small blood vessels. Single forms of Babesia bigemina are elongated or irregular in shape. Paired forms are typically pear shape, with an acute angle between them. Up to 20% of the red blood cells may be infected at the peak of the reaction. Anaplasma marginale organisms appear as dense, deeply purple staining, roundish inclusions of 0.3 to 1 micrometer in diameter, located predominantly marginally in the red blood cells. However, at the time of examination, the parasitemia may already be very low because of the removal of most of the infected red blood cells from the circulation. The presence of a regenerative anemia also requires careful examination of blood smears to distinguish anaplasma organisms from bluish stippling in immature red blood cells. There is no simple technique for demonstrating heartwater organisms in the live animal, but in brain crush smears they usually appear as colonies of bluish purple staining granules of varying size in the cells lining the small blood vessels of the brain. A variety of molecular, biochemical and immunological tools are available which enables differentiation between the different causative organisms of tick-borne diseases in cattle. The immunofluorescent antibody test, IFAT, and specific enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, ELISA, and variations thereof, have been widely used in surveys as relatively cheap tools to detect the presence of tick-borne disease pathogens and to determine the prevalence, incidence and seasonality of infection and disease. However, subjectivity in interpretation and or lack of sensitivity and specificity, often due to cross-reactivity with closely related parasite species, has limited their usefulness as diagnostic tools in individual animals. The need for improved methods of detection of carrier animals has led to the development of a number of molecular diagnostic techniques. These are based mainly on polymerase chain reaction or PCR techniques using parasite specific primers and probes which differentiate between most hemoparasites that infect cattle. Despite being both more sensitive and specific, to date these tests do not distinguish buffalo-associated Tyleria parva infections from cattle-associated infections. In countries such as South Africa, where cattle-associated Tyleria parva, or classical East Coast fever, has been eradicated, control of buffalo-associated Tyleria parva, or corridor disease, depends mainly on maintaining infected buffalo in well-fenced game reserves to avoid any contact with cattle. As one of the big five African game species, African buffalo are highly sought-after animals in the lucrative ecotourism industry. In order to prevent Tyleria parva from spreading from buffalo to cattle in South Africa, only buffalo from known disease-free herds, or buffalo bred under strict experimental conditions, which have been certified free of Tyleria parva, have been allowed to be translocated to non-endemic areas. In endemically stable situations, cattle may acquire immunity to babesiosis, anaplasmosis, heartwater, and to a lesser extent, tyleriosis, by exposure to natural tick-transmitted infection when animals are young and protected by an age-related resistance. 
in those areas where natural tick transmission is not sufficient to ensure exposure of most young animals to the prevalent tick-borne diseases during the period of age-related resistance, an endemically unstable situation arises. However, an endemically stable situation may still be achieved under these conditions, even in exotic breeds, by integrating the strategic use of acaricides, the administration of vaccines, and the use of tick-resistant and or disease-resistant breeds of cattle. Bupavacone has proved to be a valuable therapeutic agent for the treatment of clinical tyleriosis. Treatment does not eliminate the parasite from the host, however, and recovered animals usually remain carriers. For this reason, the treatment of Tyleria parva infections in some countries, like South Africa, has been prohibited. The main compounds used for the treatment of babesiosis are diminazine and imidocarb. Both can be used prophylactically to protect animals against development of clinical disease for variable periods of up to several weeks, depending on the compound used, the dosage, and the parasite species. Particular attention should be paid to the considerably longer inhibitory effect these drugs have on parasite strains used in the vaccines. Should vaccination be considered as a long-term control option, cognizance should also be taken of the fact that immunity following vaccination may take several weeks to develop. Most importantly, it should be realized that for a significant period of time, animals will be fully susceptible to tick-transmitted parasites. This coincides with the period after the prophylactic effect of the drugs has waned, until immunity develops after vaccination. During this period, animals should be kept tick-free as far as is practically possible to prevent disease outbreaks due to tick-transmitted parasites. Tetracyclines are the most widely used drugs for the treatment of heart water. Repeated oxytetracycline injections may be used to protect susceptible animals against heart water when they are introduced into an endemic area, while at the same time allowing them to develop a natural immunity. In many countries, tetracyclines are also the only effective drugs approved for the treatment of anaplasmosis. Although imidocarb is also effective at the dosage recommended for the chemoprophylaxis of babesiosis. Specific treatment early in the course of anaplasma infection is desirable, and such treatment prior to the development of a high parasitemia or the onset of severe anemia is considered essential for a favorable outcome. Notwithstanding successful specific treatment, the clinical condition of an animal may continue to deteriorate as a result of progressive anemia and supportive symptomatic treatment such as rumen stimulants and even a blood transfusion may be required to prevent the animal from dying. Cattle usually develop a durable immunity after a single infection with any of these tick-borne diseases. In addition, Calves exhibit a non-specific immunity to the diseases for variable periods after birth, which generally protects them against the development of severe clinical signs. These two features of tick-borne diseases in cattle have been exploited with the use of vaccines containing live parasites of well-characterized strains of the respective organisms, especially in calves. Presently, vaccination most commonly involves the administration of live parasites in the form of cryopreserved infective blood or tick homogenates of the causative organisms, which may or may not require concurrent or follow-up treatment to control possible clinical vaccine reactions. The so-called infection and treatment method of vaccination. African redwater and Asiatic redwater vaccines consist of blood from cattle infected with attenuated mild strains of Babesia bigemina and Babesia bovis, respectively. 
anaplasmosis vaccine consists of blood from cattle infected with anaplasma centrale, which, although it only provides a partial immunity, is less pathogenic than anaplasma marginale and protects cattle against the severe clinical disease caused by the latter organism. Heartwater vaccine is prepared from sheep blood containing virulent Olichia ruminantium organisms of the ball 3 isolate, which, although pathogenic, give predictable reactions in susceptible animals, allowing for timeous treatment to be administered. These tick-borne disease vaccines are usually produced in frozen form and stored at temperatures below minus 80 degrees Celsius on dry ice or in liquid nitrogen. The vaccines are thawed immediately before administration and injected intramuscularly in the case of babesiosis and anaplasmosis vaccines or strictly intravenously in the case of heartwater vaccine. Clinical signs of babesiosis and anaplasmosis may occur in some animals after vaccination, usually within a period similar to the incubation period of the respective disease, especially in animals older than nine months. On the other hand, clinical signs of heartwater more frequently occur in heartwater vaccinated cattle, except in calves less than three weeks old and high mortality rates may result if reacting animals are left untreated. Since calves do not react severely to babesiosis and anaplasmosis, it is generally advised that they be vaccinated between the age of three and nine months, when non-specific immunity will minimize the risk of reactions. More severe reactions can be expected in older animals, and they should be closely supervised. Ideally, rectal temperatures of vaccinated cattle should be taken and animals treated with the appropriate specific and symptomatic drugs when significant fever develops. In the case of hot water, the period of non-specific immunity is of much shorter duration, but immunization of calves younger than three weeks usually does not cause clinical disease. Nevertheless, the rectal temperatures of all vaccinated animals should be monitored daily and tetracycline treatment administered at the appropriate time. Although babesiosis vaccines can be given at the same time as anaplasmosis and other vaccines, heartwater vaccine should always be administered separately. This is due to the fact that the incubation periods of heartwater and babesiosis are similar thus making it difficult to determine the specific cause of a vaccine reaction in vaccinated animals. In the case of anaplasmosis, treatment of heartwater vaccine reactions with tetracyclines would compromise the development of immunity to anaplasmosis or lead to erratic anaplasmosis vaccine reactions following an extended incubation period. With regard to all tick-borne disease vaccines, Pregnant cows should preferably not be vaccinated as they may abort. The immunity which develops after vaccination lasts for several years in the case of Babesia bovis, but in the absence of natural challenge, it may break down in the case of Babesia bigemina. Although the hot water ball 3 vaccine does not protect against all field strains of hot water, the procedure is successfully used to protect most susceptible animals against the disease, especially when they are first introduced into endemic areas or if they are particularly valuable. The infection and treatment technique for East Coast fever is relatively expensive and cumbersome, but it is being implemented on an increasing scale in a number of countries and has generally proved successful. In areas where the vaccine has been used, for example in the eastern province, it was shown that the calf mortality rate dropped from 50% before the immunization started to less than 5% after immunization was commenced. So this has led farmers to really appreciate this method and choose it over the other control options because they can see the visible effects 
of the immunization process. A liquid nitrogen cold chain is essential in order to maintain parasite viability and, compared to other veterinary immunizations, more training and expertise is required for the vaccine to be delivered safely and effectively. Control of tick-borne diseases in endemic areas should ideally be based on an integrated program aimed at reducing the challenge and increasing the resistance of the cattle. The use of zebu or zebu cross cattle, which have an increased capacity for the development of resistance to ticks, should be encouraged. Exposure of calves to moderate tick challenge in early life should be allowed to facilitate the development of tick resistance and to permit infection with tick-borne parasites of all types while the animals are partially resistant. The use of acaricides should be limited to the minimum required to prevent excessive tick loads. This will substantially reduce production costs. Chemotherapy may be used to treat clinical cases should these occur. Where such measures fail to limit the prevalence of clinical disease to an acceptable level, immunization by the infection and treatment method should be implemented. In considering any control program for tick-borne diseases, it is essential to remember that any one of these diseases does not occur in isolation, but forms part of a complex of tick-borne diseases and tick worry which may all have an adverse effect on the health and productivity of cattle, especially improved high-producing breeds. In an endemic situation, intensive dipping to control one disease will most likely disrupt the acquisition of immunity to all tick-borne parasites and will lead to an upsurge of tick-borne diseases if the dipping program is interrupted for financial or political reasons. Therefore, to be lastingly effective, control programs must be aimed at the whole complex of ticks and tick-borne diseases.